Let's least say that after not just reading the headlines, but between the lines, reading the research, I've come to understand that this is a very nuanced conversation. It's not just good or bad. It's not just we should do it or we shouldn't do it. It's really about understanding, one, the bigger social context in which this is happening. The bigger social context is we are facing a metabolic health and obesity crisis that's never been seen before in the history of humanity. There's over a billion people who are obese, up 2 billion people who are overweight in the world. We have in America, it's even worse. We have 42% obese. We have 75% overweight. And 93.2% metabolic and healthy, meaning they're on the spectrum of some poor metabolic dysfunction, which is making them on their way towards prediabetes and type 2 diabetes. Uh, And the costs are staggering. We know our healthcare costs are now $4.3 trillion in direct costs. And uh, probably 80% of that is for chronic disease, mostly caused by, by our food and primarily driven by this phenomenon of insulin resistance, which is part of what Ozempic and these drugs purport to fix. So... As we start to think about how do we solve this problem, you know, I've been thinking about it from the very macro view, which is how do we deal with the food environment, the toxic food environment that's caused us to be in this situation? This is not a genetic problem. There may be genetics that load the gun, but the environment pulls the trigger. And the environment has changed in the last 50 years so dramatically that it's led to an abundance of toxic food, ultra processed food, high starch and sugar in our diet, ingredients we've never had before that are destroying our microbiome, that are destroying our nutritional resilience, that are causing poor metabolic health, and are really at the root of of so much of what's going on. So I focused on policy issues. I wrote my book, Food Fix, which is an attempt to kind of lay out why this is happening. Because I realized I couldn't cure diabetes in my office. It's cured on the farm. It's cured in the factory where they make the food. It's cured by... And, you know, in the grocery store, in the kitchen, that's where diabetes is cured. And, and, and ultimately, I realized I had to go upstream to deal with the root causes, which is our bigger food system. And we're going to get to talk about that with Callie because he's been talking about and thinking about it for a long time. And I think his new book, Good Energy, addresses a lot of these issues around metabolic health. It's his sister, Casey Means, who's been on the show. No, I often get them confused. Callie, Casey, is, I, don't know what <laughs> parents right. were, I don't know what their parents were thinking, but <laughs> I, I, think I've, I think I've sorted it out, you know? And Tina has a very different perspective, which is really around the, the micro not the macro, which is how do we deal with individuals struggling with metabolic dysfunction who've tried everything, done everything, hit the wall, can't make it work, struggle, white knuckle, and just can't get their bodies back into a state of good metabolic health. And we're going to talk about how she does that, why it's different than the traditional approaches to the use of these drugs, and why we need to rethink how we're doing this. So this is going to be a very interesting conversation. I'm really excited to dive in. And so first, we're going to start with the macro and and start with Callie, because I, I want you to set the stage for the situation we're in around our poor metabolic health and obesity and, and what this is doing to us as a society, economically, socially, politically, uh, even in terms of our, our social divisions and conflict, all driven by the effect of these things on our physical and mental health. So can you kind of unpack for us, Callie, how you see the current state of affairs in, in the realm of, of weight and obesity? You know, I, I really just read an article this morning and said, it's not okay to say someone's obese. You have to say they, they're, they're uh, someone with obesity. <laughs> it's, it's like, it's, I, I get it, but we have kind of have to sort of take a hard look at this. And so tell, tell us from your perspective, how should we be thinking about this problem at a macro level? Thank you so much for convening this conversation. Dr. Tina's had a huge impact on me, and I really think this is important to have a long-form, nuanced conversation that goes over the micro and the macro. And as you said, I've been really focused on the macro. Um, I think there's some really important macro considerations that patients need to know before thinking about Ozempic. And that is that this is really about the median American and the median American child. 94% of the country is metabolically dysfunctional. Something has happened all at once, as you point Mm -hmm. out so well in Food Fix. Uh, just looking at kids, 20 to 25 percent of young adults having fatty liver disease, 50 percent of young adults being overweight or obese, uh, by some counts, 33 percent of young adults having prediabetes. It's a moral stain on our country where I think through very observable and very definable situations, we're poisoning our kids. Uh, we're poisoning them chiefly by food, the rise of ultra processed food, which was close to 0% 100 years ago, and now up to 70% of a child's diet by some counts. I Did go it all pl- started with like what, Crisco in 1911? Yeah, and it started with good intentions after World War II to kind of feed the world and make ultra processed food, but it's been weaponized. And, you know, food companies now are one of the largest employers of of scientists to weaponize our food against us. And I can't go to a playground with my two-year-old without seeing almost every kid there, you know, drinking Coke, drinking sugary drinks. So fundamentally, this is a question about what is the solve for this metabolic health crisis and the different branches on that crisis of the diabetes crisis, the heart disease crisis, the obesity crisis. And 
I think my main point is that the medicalization siloing of chronic disease has been an utter failure. Yeah. Um, now, I'm not saying a doctor shouldn't prescribe a statin or metformin if that's the case and that's the determination, but the overall default to isolating and medicalizing a chronic condition has been bad. The world would be a better place if we actually didn't go this route of seeing heart disease as a statin deficiency, seeing diabetes as a metformin deficiency, seeing high blood pressure as an inhibitor deficiency, seeing depression as an SSRI deficiency. My argument, I actually think the data is clear on this. If those drugs were- You mean pros uh, depression is not a Prozac deficiency? Yeah, exactly. And, I, and my argument, I think the data is clear on this. If you actually took those drugs off the table, if they didn't exist, and the medical system actually asked, what's the root cause of these conditions? What should we spend $4.5 trillion on actually solving these conditions? It would actually go to the things you talk about, about core lifestyle habits. And the issue and what the obesity epidemic represents with 80% of American adults now being overweight or obese is that we really have a dirty tank. We have a fundamentally lost our way in crony capitalism and rigging the system, basically poisoning the American people. And is that an ozempic deficiency? Should we do more of the same in the really the most pronounced chronic condition for the median American, for the median child? Mm -hmm. Should we be prescribing the ozempic? And I really think when you reel that back, the answer is no, right? I'm not talking about you know 400 pound, extremely diabetic person. That's between the patient and the doctor. But when the American Academy of Pediatrics is saying that the average 12 year old should be on Ozempic, when this is being pushed on six year olds who have an obesity crisis, that gets over 20% of kids in the US have childhood obesity. And in Japan, it's it's three to 4%, right? We have unique dynamics mm. happening in America and it completely takes our eye off the ball to say that's an Ozempic deficiency. Novo Nordics right now is the 12th most valuable company in the world. It's the most valuable company in Europe. It's the biggest contributor to GDP in Denmark, the country right. that- <laughs> but, but interestingly, their revenue and profits aren't coming from Europe. This no, is not the standard. Is it true they don't allow Zempic to be sold in Denmark? Is that true? It's not the standard of care. First off, in Denmark, it's under $100 and they are making all their money off Americans where mm -hmm. they charge sixteen dollars to $1,800. A month. They're taking advantage of Americans, but it's not the standard of care in Denmark. I was in Denmark last year. They have sound food policies. Their people are biking, walking around. And actually, if you have obesity, you're, the doctor is able to prescribe exercise and a keto diet that's subsidized by the government. Ozempic is not the standard of care yeah. for obesity. When you actually look at the stock analysis, 80 to 90 percent of profit expectations are coming from the United States. Yeah, They're course. taking advantage of the United States. So we have a dirty fish tank, right? The problem is not an Ozempic deficiency. The problem is when are we going to say we're going to stop poisoning kids? They're talking about using this in kids, but we're filling the schools with ultra processed junk food that these kids are eating for lunch and that the school lunch program is so messed up that these kids aren't getting healthy nutritious food that's helping them right be metabolically healthy or mentally healthy right so then we look at okay how would he use this for the instructions on ozempic is as a lifetime drug it actually though was a warning so let's just look at what novo nordic says they said this is not a like a quick use this is not for a kickstart this is a lifetime drug and there's actually some serious warnings if you go off the drug and gain the weight back and actually unknown metabolic effects. So that's what Novo Nordic says. And they're actually saying with the help of the American Academy of Pediatrics, which early in my career I helped pay by pharma companies, this is a subsidiary of pharma companies, this Danish company is one of the top contributors to it. They're saying that a 12 year old, it should be the first line of defense. It shouldn't be after dietary interventions fail. It says if a 12 year old gains a little bit of weight, put them on this drug for life. So the American Academy of Pediatrics doesn't have first line therapy as lifestyle? They're saying that they, we need urgent, quick interventions on surgery and Ozempic and not after dietary interventions failed. That's what the recent press release and guidance from the American Academy of Pediatrics well, that seems said. pretty messed The up. American Academy of <laughs> Pediatrics has not spoken out about Coca-Cola machines and pediatric wards and classrooms. They've not spoken out about the fact that 10% of food stamp funding goes to Coca-Cola. They've not spoken out about our agriculture subsidies, but they have said that if your 12 year old gains a little bit of weight, they need to be on this injection for the rest of their life. Now, what's the problem with this, right? As we know from your work, that if you're not taking the opportunity to train that child on metabolically healthy items, to train them on exercise, to train them on healthy food, to train them on having awe and curiosity for what they're putting in their body, they're gonna continue to rack up comorbidities. You know, if somebody's anorexic, their LDL levels are probably gonna go down right away, but they're, that, that's not a sustainable long-term strategy. That's essentially what Ozempic does. It's a crash course calorie deficit, not train that child you know, for any type of awe or curiosity or lifestyle change that's needed, even if they're eating and on this drug for life, 
right? They're fundamentally still sedentary, like our kids are, and still putting ultra processed food, which is going to lead to other metabolically healthy items. So what doctors are saying now is that, and I think you've said this, that you have to exercise. You have to, and actually Novo Nordics is even admitting this. They're saying you have well, to shift to from a- they've seen their studies at, that you lose significant right, muscle mass. They're saying that, that it's a huge disaster if you take this drug and don't exercise four to five times a week with weight training yeah. and shift to a non-ultra processed food, high protein diet. My message is this. Yeah. Let's start with that first. Let's start with steering the trillions of dollars of incentives of a medical system to doing that first yeah. before we're drugging anyone because it's a contradiction because what's actually happening is you have doctors at Harvard and the American Academy of Pediatrics saying the reverse. They're saying that o obesity is now genetic. They have to define obesity as genetic in order to get taxpayer funding for this drug. You actually have the leading obesity research at Harvard Dr. Fatima Cody Stanford saying, throw willpower, throw diet, throw exercise out the window. So on the one hand, you actually have doctors arguing that this is a genetic condition and basically a drug deficiency. Isn't she conflicted a little bit? And she's paid so we can get into the corruption. <laughs> so, so, so when we have a dirty tank, when you have this massive societal issue, the biggest branch of the tree of metabolic dysfunction, when are we going to say that our healthcare policy needs to go towards metabolically healthy habits. Mm. In this case, Ozempic is a problem for two ways. Number one, it's a distraction. It's it's once again saying the, the cure is in the medication. We're telling 50% of 12 year olds who are overweight or obese, you're okay. The doctors aren't saying that the kid has to work out four times a week. Yeah. And shift their diet. That's not what anyone well, is saying. No that you're anymore, saying right? you're saved now from this drug. That's why I think this problem is one of the biggest issues in the country. Ozempic is a disaster if the drug was perfect because it's giving the wrong message when it's not the solve to the problem. And there's a massive opportunity cost where for fifteen to eighteen hundred dollars a month, we could change our agriculture system to regenerative ag. We could give every obese child in the country a card to buy organic whole yeah. food. So yeah. it's a disaster from that that perspective. It's also medically extremely problematic. Uh, this actually, to my estimation, you tell me, I, I think it's actually the highest and most pronounced side effects of any drug widely approved in modern American history. 80% of people on this drug have nausea and 30% uh, have extreme vomiting. It has a black box warning, which we should take seriously. If we take the other studies seriously, we should take that very seriously, a black box warning for uh, thyroid cancer. And it, the issues are so pronounced for mental health because it's disrupting our microbiome, which produces 95% of our serotonin. The EU, which is actually much more uh, quizzical about this drug, is launching a massive investigation for suicidal ideation. I looked at that data, and I think some there's some questions about well, it. Well, this is short-term data. Yeah. Well, well, well th this is exactly the point, actually. This is extremely short-term indicators. They approved this drug on a 68-week rig study to approve for 12-year-olds for life. The, the, the research, if it's showing any leading indicators that Novo Norex has to, has, has to admit, that's a serious problem, because these are all their studies are funded by Novo Norex and very rushed. So if there's any indicator whatsoever, which necessitates that black box warning. The other thing I'll say is let's just back up and, and go to like what I've learned from you, which is that what is our body telling us if 80% of the people have nausea, if 30% are throwing up? What that That's telling us that this drug is producing some unknown metabolic issues right. throughout our body and really has some interconnected problems that we fully don't even understand. Yet. That's what it tells me. I think it's true. There are a lot of side effects if you take it in a way that actually is prescribed currently. But there are other ways of using the drug. We're going to talk about with Tina that mitigate a lot of the side effects, that, that avoid a lot of the problems you're talking about, and that aren't using the product that's from the pharmaceutical industry. It's from compounding pharmacies, which is a kind of a left field thing that people don't know about. But there, the, the, what's really striking is you can you can get these drugs for twenty dollars a month if you get them from compounding pharmacies and and the, at, at doses that are far lower that may be effective without a lot of the complications and side effects. And combined with an a Surfboard, boogie board, skateboard, diving board, full board, half board. I think I'll try the cheese board. Board games, boarding passes. Don't forget your boarding gig. Tourist board, chess board, menu board. 